security establishment is bored with chasing terrorists. And it's now wanting to move into the big time, uh, trying to pick a fight with China. Uh, and that's uh, exercising just uh, all of their time. And they have also managed now to totally dominate the normal departments of government in terms of policy formation. Um, some actually look forward, or appear to look forward to a war with China. Uh, and uh, they don't seem to be bothered about how millions would be killed and made. Uh, but first, uh, before going on to look at the war with China, uh, I want to look at what's happened to civil liberties in this country. Uh, it might seem rather hard, odd that uh, Menzies was an unlikely hero on one aspect of uh, civil liberties uh, while he was Prime Minister. We know that he wasn't in relation to uh, letting Asia have its head and so forth. Uh, well, not, not to bad this now. Uh, when his Attorney General brought in a new and really tough espionage bill, uh, he threw it out in its entirety, the entire country. Imagine today the Attorney General putting up a new es espionage bill in the lottery to throw it out. And, uh, but it was all downhill after that. Uh, it's crucial that ASIO not be allowed to become a secret police. And yet this is what has happened. And it started, unfortunately, uh, under Rudd. Sorry, not under Rudd, under Hall, who allowed them to remain, have legal protection, to be anonymous. Now, I don't think they should ever have been anonymous, but it makes no sense uh, when they also got police powers, and this is what's happened. Uh, but before we get to there, it's worth having a look at uh, just what some of the changes were that occurred under law. Uh, Fraser had basically abolished the order of subversion type uh, clauses which allowed ACA to at least you know, investigate and follow around all sorts of people. And Hawke basically reversed that. And then uh, he took a rather odd stand in relation to uh, the David Coombe case, where the head of ASIO, Harvey Barnett at the time, said that uh, David Coombe was not a problem. There was no problem at all. He was not a Soviet agent or anything like that. Once they booted Ivan up, the, uh, dip, the diplomat or KGB guy, that uh, <coughs> was basically trying to get some money out of in terms of in re representing them on trade issues. But uh, Hawke insisted that a very, very deep and uh, long-lasting investigation go on and it got nowhere. And, uh, and, it, and also, it, oddly enough, the a a official ASIO history uh, criticised the head of ASIO uh, very harshly and backed talk on that. And I, I said to him after he retired, I said, what happened there? He said, look, uh, with the Ivanov thing, he said, uh, I passed him the ball and he kicked it out of the ground. I thought that what, once we'd put it out Ivanov, that was enough. He also refused a, an order from a Prime Minister to tap my phone in Parliament House. So how things have changed in terms of uh, ASIO uh, in, that, in that area. Um, before September 11, the terrorist attacks in New York, uh, there were 154 acts of terrorism in Australia between 1996 and 2001. And they were serious. People got killed, they got bombed, you know, they got stabbed, they got shot, and all the rest of it. And Yet in one case, the bombing at the Hilton Hotel, uh, which occurred while Fraser was hosting 12 foreign dignitaries, or whatever you want to call them, uh, at the Commonwealth Head, regional of Commonwealth Head with government meeting in 1978. Uh, three people were killed and 11 injured. But what did he do? Did he rush out and bring in terrorism laws? No, he didn't do it at all. Up till then, uh, the police had the right or had relied on the intelligence services on the the law against murder. And that what that's what terrorism is. There's no need for any other laws that I can see. And uh, however there are now over eighty terrorism laws, many of which increasingly have got nothing to do with terrorism. That's just the umbrella name they give it to allow police and uh, so forth to to move into areas they've never had any powers in before. Yeah. And, uh, what, uh, what you see in, uh, say, one of the biggest changes and one of the most important was in 2002, when an act of parliament let ASIO detain and question people, uh, innocent people, the, the, the 
Attorney General introducing the bill made it clear that people being detained were innocent of any suspicion of any crime, yet they were detained because they might have information that ASL wants and more importantly one of its overseas agencies that is in contact with it. And, and that, then people were forced to give answers to questions that will face five years jail, or if they spoke about it later, they also face five years jail. Now the most obvious thing that the problem is here is that, say the Americans wanted to know the whereabouts of some person that might be living in Spain or somewhere, so <coughs> uh, and he's got a cousin or something in Australia, that person is entirely uh, right to refuse to give any sort of information with help extrajudicial execution, which is what the Americans or others would have in mind. But not instead they'd get five years jail if they didn't do it. They didn't answer the questions. Um, just another way in which it, it, the, the, the arrogance now of police and the intelligence services is that uh, the federal police raided Parliament uh, when a while back to try and get some information about who were the link to Labor, uh, something, some stuff about the NBN. All it was about was how it was over budget and so forth and so on. Normal stuff. It's nothing classified. It wasn't a secret or anything like that. So the, uh, instead of charging the federal police, because they took away huge numbers of files and computer and laptops and hard disks and all the rest, uh, now instead of charging ASIA with contempt, the parliament, uh, which is supposed to be at the peak of the clinical Australian political system, uh, didn't do anything. And to make sure that nothing happened like this in the future, no threat of, of, of any sort of retaliation, the law was changed so that the federal police can, and ASIO if it wants to, federal police can um, go after documents which they regard as harmful, but not classified documents. So they broaden that thing enormously. A third area that's just an enormous change is that they, it's now a criminal offence to do anything that causes harm to relations with a foreign country. And that's what's harm is going to be decided by the Attorney General or whatever. <laughs> now, the world wasn't always like this. The head of, there was a proposal to do this when uh, a, a retired Chief, Chief Justice of the High Court had a bee in his mind about how it must be a criminal offence to leak economic information. And he had a report, a review of the criminal law, in which he recommended it would become a, a criminal offence. And the then head of the Treasury, Tony Cole, wrote a submission when she said uh, he had looked back over Australian economic history and never once that anything caused serious damage at all or any leak. He was opposed to any new law because what it would do, given the governments this power, was that governments would abuse these powers. I can't imagine any head of the government department so writing that sort of stuff uh, these days. Yeah. Um, now, the ABC has mentioned in the introduction here, uh, lost a court case today, or it was yesterday, wasn't it, or whatever, where the AFP has found out a right to raid the offices of, of media organisations and take away huge amounts of information. In this case, they were chasing uh, down, allegedly, who leaked information which, which was used for a really good program by Dan Oakes and uh, Sam Clark uh, about alleged war crimes, pretty serious allegations backed up by reasonably uh, convincing evidence, but we need to see if anyone comes to court whether that's the case. But um, they, the, if the police, it's very simple, the person who did it put his hand up and said, I leaked it. So they couldn't be after that. They can pretty only be after the journalists. And uh, so at this stage, I don't know what will happen. But, uh, but however, that is a shining example of the ABC doing good work. And from then, then on, I think it's been downhill for it. In particular, it got given, just out of nowhere, a safe from a, containing a whole lot of cabinet. It had been thrown out by the, and was like a second-hand deal or something. Uh, <laughs> I think in Canberra. And, uh, and they, it, it, it was full of cabinet submissions, right? And, and they said that they would not they just rang up ASIA and said, come and take away the terrible, dreadful thing, get it out of the building, you can't look at it. And, uh, and, the, and they said that we were worried about containing information that someone could get killed. They don't understand cabinet submissions. There's nothing in a cabinet submission ever 
that says, oh, by the way, this is the name of our agent in that, in, in, in that sort of terrorism group or whatever it is, you know. Uh, it is just a ludicrous thing. Yet, and they went on to also say that in, in their defence of this that they were worried that, like, Assange would put people's lives at risk. Well, he hadn't. Uh, what had happened was that any risk there, and they were documents that were leaked, that were leaked to, him, to WikiLeaks, uh, were uh, only secret or below. And none of, the, none of the people that might be regarded as sources were given code words so that if it was decrypted, you'd never work out who it is. As it's happened, um, that, that, I mean, that's the moral responsibility of both the State Department and the US Defence Department for not doing that. But no one's been killed. And the head of the then head of the US Defence Department saying, look, you get upset when these things happen, but now it's not, it's not a problem. And uh, yet they're still hounding the you know, whatever number of years it is afterwards. Um, and uh, I'll just uh, move on and read any of this um, a little bit. Um, to um, what, what journalists, I don't, this is a huge change in Australian society, and that is that journalists now uh, are basically, in many journalists, not all, are in bed with the national security establishment, particularly the intelligence uh, services, some uh, think tanks who are funded by arms and manufacturers, etc., from America and the government, and uh, also by people on the Parliamentary Committee of the Security and Intelligence. Journalists always put the powerful head of it, Mr. Hastie, you know, the sort of stuff. Who I thought his main claim to fame is to cut the hands off some prisoners in uh, Afghanistan when he was in the SAS. And uh, I don't know what it, And he said he was doing it so he could be identified. I guess he would have, he would have searched the database of uh, fingerprints for, for Afghanis in, in the police <laughs> department. But um, what. Uh, what, what's really disturbing is they go in on the basis that intelligence must be true, mainly because it's called intelligence or something, you know, rather than information. But the, it, how often do we have to be reminded that intelligence is often wrong, sometimes deliberately so, as in the case of the weapons of mass destruction, which was used as the rationale for the invasion of Iraq, and, you know, a dreadful dreadful consequences of which continue to this day. And that was completely trumped up intelligence. That was based, that was based on phony evidence, I won't say Trump in this case. Um, and the, the damage continues to this day. And uh, I, why you wouldn't be thereafter sceptical of whether or not what you're being told is concocted for some other purpose, I, I do not know. Of course, sometimes, uh, information called intelligence can be right, um, but I think increasingly it is being manipulated uh, to, for policy goals uh, or, or to help policy goals. I'll give you another example of how, or most importantly, secrecy uh, is has a very, very bad influence on accuracy in assessing information because you don't discuss it with a wide range of people. You only discuss it with your colleagues. And a good example of that was uh, back in 1991, I think it was, when the assistant, sorry, the deputy head of ASIO, um, at the time, a guy called, uh, I can't even read my own writing now, but uh, he was uh, uh, Walsh, uh, and his first name was, um, can't read it. And um, he, he gave a public speech saying that the leaking of intelligence had caused people to be murdered in Australia, and that later brief journalist saying there were three murders that he knew of. And unlike what would happen these days, <laughs> what would happen these days with the Labour or Coalition Attorney General, the then Attorney General, Michael Lavash, the Labour Attorney General, uh, smelled a rat. So he demanded to know the evidence. And Clark, not Clark, Watch could not give me. And so he publicly, uh, he, he uh, publicly announced that this stuff was not true. These days, there's, I don't believe there's an attorney general who would do that. They just, they just shiver in their boots when talking to, to Asia. And um, so uh, I, uh, now what's happened more recently, which I find immensely disturbing, is that just after he retired, the then head of ASIO, Duncan Lewis, 
warned Australians that China seeks to take over, take over the country and one day they'll wake up and find that they've been taken over. And how is this going to happen? Because they had uh, developed a huge network of, of using disinformation, so agents of influence here. And a, a leaked story from ASIO that earlier referred to <laughs> that referred to Manchurian candidates that they, they were grooming these Manchurian candidates who would take over the Australian government. I uh, I did when I saw the Gladys Lue there come a Liberal member of Parliament at the last election. I thought, ha, ah, this may be one of those uh, Manchurian candidates. The only trouble is. I've read the book and seen the movie, and they're very, very confusing. So I don't know what her task was, her mission was in Parliament. Was it to kill the Prime Minister or become the Prime Minister? <laughs> I'm just very, very confused. But uh, likewise, or more recently, uh, look, which my plea, by the way, that the whole idea, and the idea that a head of an intelligence assessment agency should talk about the Australian government from taking over by agents of an influence from China is just so much nonsense. You would have to have the Prime Minister and the Cabinet on the side, you'd have to have the whole senior public servants on the side, the military, you'd have to have judicial figures, you'd have to have journalists. It is absurd, particularly at a time when China is, you know, no one seems to like China anyway at all, so I don't see at the moment in Australia, so I don't see that as, as at all plausible. Yet, uh, we go on to find that uh, uh, the, that the so this time it was the Fairfax Group in, in Channel 9 uh, produced this absolutely overexcited, you know, ludicrously sort of uh, hyped up story on, channel, on, on the 60 Minutes program, which basically began by saying, look, uh, President Xi doesn't normally watch 60 Minutes, but ah, oh, he'll be watching tonight because I'm, <laughs> I'm going to reveal how a big spy has defected. It turned out the guy was not a spy at all. And, uh, and they've never been able to, <laughs> never been able to you know, scramble back from that nonsense. And, but the other thing is that journalists also wrote up that uh, there was a per they called a person who was uh, in a car dealer in Victoria or Melbourne, they called him a spy. Now, what he, because they said that he was going to be pushed into Parliament by the Chinese intelligence services and so forth. And uh, the problem was, I would have thought, was that um, he had no chance whatsoever of getting into Parliament. He was a disgraced bloody businessman who overexcited journalists described him as a spy. Uh, and what had happened was that he was under charges, been charged with very serious financial uh, uh, offences. He was uh, drastically in debt and he committed suicide. And the parliamentary committee wanted that reinvestigated, even though the Victorian police found that he had, and so did his family, so that that's what he'd done. Now, it's true, obviously, that China engages in espionage and foreign interference, uh, nor so do many other countries, including Australia. After all, we notoriously bumped the newly independent Timor Leste's cabinet officers. So, uh, so that Woodside uh, could get a bit of deal out of the borders that were being drawn up. Uh, and um, as, uh, you know, just to give an example, in the United States, an uh, Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland told a, a conference in 2013 that the United States had spent $5 billion since 2001 trying to gain a, a favourable political outcome in Ukraine. Uh, now, that's five billion. Right? That, that is serious money. But she also told the Congress, the Congressional Committee, that in one year she had arranged to spend one hundred million dollars trying to on anti Putin activities within Russia or around the borders of Russia, and uh, she implied there was an ongoing program. So, not surprisingly, Putin retaliated, but it cost him far less money to uh, try to destabilized slightly the American uh, election in 2016. Um, so the reporting on that, including a three-part series of all things uh, on Four Corners at the beginning of last year, um, did not bother to mention uh, any of the spending 
by the Americans that they acknowledged on trying to destabilize uh, Putin. And in the case of the, um, this car deal, by the way, Hasty, the chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security, said that the, the car deal was a perfect target for cultivation of a foreign intelligence service. He would have been a disaster. He might have got into Parliament one week and, met, and declared bankrupt the next. But uh, anyway, uh, while this huge change in the whole focus of the intelligence services on China uh, and is, very, is uh, a major, major thing in Australian politics and what's happening. The Foreign Affairs Department has no say in these things. It's just that they both driving this thing and so are some uh, of the think tanks and that. One think tank, the Australian uh, Strategic Policy Institute, has been funded by the State Department to uh, draw up lists of uh, universities in China that are unsound to work with on science. And uh, that, that I would have thought was foreign interference, if you like, in Australian, policy, in Australian politics. But we were the vice chancellors. Surely they must make the decision if they're going to be independent of which, uh, which scientists they go into proper uh, arrangements with or which university, etc., etc. And it's a very valuable thing to do because China is now about equal to the United States in terms of scientific publications in, in scientific journals. Uh, the, I, find, I find this really weird because I'd always thought of... Uh, Edward Teller has been a complete, a complete haul in terms of the development of the hydrogen bomb and all of that. And, uh, however, he also was a, a zealous uh, guardian of, in, of, of no interference in, or no secrecy surrounding research and science. He believed no secrecy at all that in scientific research, not, including the nuclear research, it wouldn't have bothered him if said at that moment the whole lot uh, uh, you know, absolutely public from the beginning. Um, and so I, I want to make one other point that's often missed, and that is that in this fervor to catch Chinese spies and spend a lot of money on it and toughen up all the espionage laws and that, sometimes catching spies can be an absolute terrible thing to do. There was a, a back in the 1980s, the uh, NATO uh, was hold, held a very, very secretive exercise, uh, military exercise, in which they normally they try to tell some signal in some way to the Soviets they were doing it. They changed all their codes and the tanks were up going towards the Soviet border, or fighter planes carrying nuclear weapons in the skies and so forth. And it, not surprising that the Soviets thought, well, hang on, we better be ready to retaliate. And by a miracle, Two spies that they had, one in NATO and one in London, managed to get through. Imagine all the turmoil in Moscow at that time and say, no, it's not, it's just an exercise. You know, don't, when well, he wasn't, start throwing nuclear weapons around. Now, if those spies had been caught by a diligent but counterintelligence organisation, or by the parliamentary committee in Canberra, um, <laughs> the, the, the world would have faced a, a nuclear catastrophe. And, um, and finally, I just want to turn to the other aspect of, of, of this lust for a war with China. This is why we want to, we're trying to get these giant submarines for $200 billion in that to operate up just near the, the coast of China. And if something goes wrong and a conflict starts even accidentally, um, I don't believe, and even if China lost the first bit, I don't think they'd stop there. They would be willing to retaliate. And in the end, you must remember there is only one thing that would, I think there's only one thing that could ensure an ensure a enduring victory in China would be to take over, uh, invade the place, first up, and then, which might be like going into an enormously firestorm, but then take over at least 100 cities, which you then would have to Run, then win the guerrilla war in the uh, maybe 100 years guerrilla war in the countryside, etc. And, that, and that's uh, how Australian soldiers would be uh, 
would be uh, occupied for the next hundred years. Uh, it is absurd. This whole stuff about China and influence and all this stuff, there are big things happening that Australia needs to deal with global warming, the prospect of nuclear war or trying to reduce it, uh, and the species uh, extinction and things like in knowledge distribution, income in Australia and so on. These are things that matter. What doesn't matter is whether some regard party or not getting to be parliament, you know. Thanks.